Um, hello, it is really, really nice to be here. Um, I spend a lot of my time studying audit and feedback and doing systematic reviews of audit and feedback and trying to determine the best way to do audit and feedback in a very sort of academic way. Um, so even so far today, it's just been such a pleasure. I have this awesome table back there, table number seven, shout out to them, um, to kind of converse with a group that's trying to apply these theories um, in lots of sort of real world healthcare applications. So it's really nice for me to be able to do that and sort of pull these two worlds together. So um, is this my slides? Oh, the big green button, there we go. <laughs> So just, to, just a, a note, I am one of a very large team. Um, the, the paper about the 15 suggestions was a smaller sort of subset of a very large audit and feedback family. Um, there's probably about 60, 70, 80 of us um, worldwide doing work related to audit and feedback. Um, the specific 15 suggestions came from a smaller group. This is our group. Um, a lot of folks at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. We've got Kevin Eva from UBC, Noah Ivers at U of T, Susan Mickey's at UCL, University College London in the UK, and Ann Sales is in Michigan and also with the VA. So I'm going to talk about what audit and feedback is in the way that I look at audit and feedback. And I know that actually um, the stuff that I'm going to talk about is directly re relevant to what you're doing. And I'm going to try it as much as I possibly can to kind of move it in that direction. Um, the effectiveness of audit and feedback and some ways that we can actually um, improve the effectiveness of it and the effectiveness of, of using it. So what is audit and feedback? So the definition that I like is actually not the one in the Cochrane Review. I think it falls just a little bit short. So audit and feedback is a summary, some sort of summary of clinical performance, the audit, collecting data in some way, um, over a specific period of time, and then providing that summary back in the form of feedback to individual practitioner teams or healthcare organizations. Um, so audit, collect the data, and feed it back. And so almost all of the audit and feedback that we look at and that's done for, um, most of it is done for the idea of changing service provider behavior. So collecting data on how much someone is washing their hands, on how much they're prescribing antibiotics they shouldn't, et cetera, um, and then feeding that back. But a lot of the, the audit that is actually done is also related to patient outcome data and fed back to providers. So a lot of what we're studying is looking at how you use that data to change what a provider is doing. Um, and But I do think that the application is all the same, whether you want to collect data to actually change what clients are doing, or I'll just use the word client, um, patient, consumer, not a customer. Um, I'll just use the word client. Um, sometimes patient will roll off to my tongue, but um, anyway, I'll try to use either of those two words. And, but I think that all of it is really about collecting data about something to give to someone for a certain purpose. So I think this all applies to, to the way we've been looking at it as well as what we're talking about here. So what do some of these things look like? So I'm sure you've seen a lot of them. I've pulled sort of a couple of representative examples from the latest Cochrane update on the use of audit and feedback. Um, and this is, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to just talk a little bit about what this looks like. And I think I'll start to use words and descriptions that hopefully you'll be able to see in the 15 suggestions about the ways people do this well and the ways people don't do this well. So this was, I can't see the whole slide. Uh, oh yeah, report. So this was this was a paper reported in JAMA. They asked, um, "Can hospital administration data improve quality of care?" So what they did is that this was they were calling this a hospital report card. Um, they looked at 77 hospitals in Quebec. They looked at 12 outcomes. So this one is important one to look at because what they did is they looked at um, what patients were doing and gave that as feedback to providers to change their behavior. So they were looking at whether or not people filled the prescriptions that they were given. So they actually looked at 12 different outcomes. So we sort of take a while. I've been looking at this for a couple of years, so I can actually relatively quickly explain it. So imagine looking at this for the first time. So this is only four of the 12 that you had been given. You, your hospital's in yellow. You sort of, sort of figure that out. The different outcomes are different colors. So the colors mean something, but it takes a while to figure out. Um, I don't think you probably can't see it very well. How well can you see this? They've got an extra screen at the back. Oh, okay. So, so, so this, so up here they gave you two, two graphs um, on one outcome. And so if you look at the top one, you can kind of see, okay, there's your hospital. 
Um, there was a target rate that says 85%. Um, this is the um, percent of patients up the side. So the percent of my hospital's patients that filled the prescription for beta blockers compared to the teaching hospital, compared to the whole Quebec average. The histogram below is a little bit harder to kind of figure out. Is that good? Is that bad? And so this is what people were given. Um, they, it, they were not, the, the cardiac physicians were not given this information. This was given to the CEO and the director of the hospital and under the assumption that some magic was going to occur and um, <laughs> care was going to improve. So this did not work at all. Um, they were given this once too, based on data from the previous year. So this is, a, this is actually a pretty sort of typical. Here's another relatively typical one. They wanted, um, this was in the Annals of Family Medicine. They were looking at feedback versus general reminders, um, and they wanted to increase the rate at which family docs were referring people to a smoking cessation quit line. Um, 380 family medical doctors, 87 practices, and they sent this to them um, six times over 18 months. So four times over a year, and then another two times. So they've sort of given this quarterly. So they were given this actually enough times to get it, maybe change what they were doing, and then see, see the outcome of that. So again, we're sort of looking at this. So it tells you down here, it gives you a few instructions, unlike the other one. The bold line that you can kind of see indicates 100% benchmark performance. So it tells me. So imagine you're S doctor. So I'm looking at this, I'm saying, okay, I'm 34% of the 100%. It tells me I had three referrals for the quarter. I needed nine. So 34% means three. So I did three, I needed nine, I was short six, so I have to sort of think this all through. And the benchmark is based on the top 10 performers of the previous quarter. So my benchmark is changing all the time. And then it also gives me another one that tells me, okay, uh, fourth quarter of 2002, I had that many referrals, first quarter of 2003, second quarter. So that tells me my specific referrals by quarter. And then here's, here's one more. This was a study that was looking at trying to decrease the amount physicians were doing knee x-rays where they were not indicated. So this one, um, all right, number of practices, like think how long this takes. So there's me, I'm one of a group of five practices that prescribe 55 per 1,000 patients. Now I'm trying to compare, so wow, there's like one or two practices that were 85 per 1,000 patients over the last six months, I believe. So I can start to sort of think how immediate is this? This was from, from the last six months. Um, is it patient specific in any way? Not really um, frequent. I was given this once and only once. Is there anything here about the correct answer? Does there anything here tell me what it is I'm supposed to do? It gives me information, but it doesn't help me move forward. And what about the cognitive load, essentially, in looking at this? Imagine that I actually had maybe a minute or two of a physician's time in looking at this and what they were going to do with it. So right now, there's about 140 trials in the latest Cochrane review on the effective audit and feedback. It is one of what I'll sort of call the KT intervention. So an intervention that we're doing directed at a provider in order to improve the quality of care. It is one of the most effective. So in some contexts, there's a group of trials in this group that have a 70 increase in improvement. Massive. There's also, though, some that have negative. This is the only KT intervention in all of the EPOC, the Effective Practice and Organization of Care Reviews, that you can actually make things worse with audit and feedback. It's the only one that you can actually, that they found that that, that happens. So I mean, that's actually really important. It's not always necessarily neutral. There's context, context in which you will decrease the quality of care with using audit and feedback. I wish I knew exactly in what context that is, but we are not quite there yet. So um, trying to kind of pull apart when, so what do we do to get the 70? And what can we avoid to get the minus two or three? And so I think I, I'm, it would be nice to have way more absolutes, um, but we don't have absolutes. We do have 15 suggestions though. We didn't call them recommendations, we called them suggestions. And we're slowly working at trying to be a lot more specific about saying these are the things to do. But I can tell you some things. So I'm gonna go through the 15 suggestions relatively quickly, but. 
Um, what I wanted to highlight are some results from the Cochrane Review. So the Cochrane Review actually tried to look at some aspects of the audit and feedback that were more related to effectiveness. So these are integrated in our 15 suggestions, but I think these are a bit special because we have empirical evidence that these things matter for using audit and feedback to change service provider behavior. So one, when performance is poor. Audit and feedback works less well for people that are actually doing pretty good and you'd like them to do a little better, way less effective for that. Much more effective for the people that are really performing poorly. Um, when it's provided by a respected person. Um, or So what that means in surgery versus primary care, like there's a lot of nuance there that I can't do lots of specifics, but actually the, the data coming from a trusted source and a respected source is very important. Provided more than once, both verbally and in writing, and including goals and action planning. So what am I gonna do with this? So I'll talk a little bit more about those, but I did wanna sort of address and highlight those before I, I talk about the 15 suggestions. So, oh, I didn't make it do that. Okay, um, must have already been in the slide. So um, I'm just gonna do very quickly related to methods. It's my obligation as an academic to do this. Our group um, believe that the notion of feedback is really old. So this idea of actually giving you feedback on how you were doing your midterms in a course is a form of feedback, right? It's actually a very old concept. So the idea was that lots of different disciplines actually know a lot about feedback. Cognitive psychologists know a lot about feedback and they've known it for many, many decades. So our idea was that there's actually a lot of principles around effective feedback that we could learn from and apply to this context, but it's spread across a lot of different disciplines. And actually being able to review all of that literature is just too massive. And we we didn't have the expertise in our team to do that. So we thought, what if we interviewed all of these people? So that's what we did. So we actually identified theory experts with a lot of um, expertise in feedback. Um, we interviewed close to 30 people from a range of disciplines, economics, management, um, human factors, um, medical decision making, etc. Um, and we showed them examples of all of these feedback and told them to tell us what's wrong with this. How would you do it better? Um, what is the best way to do this? And what we ended up with was 389 suggestions, hypotheses for what effective audit and feedback would actually look like. So it's a massive number. But as we've been sort of going through this data, we realized that there was a lot in there that was sort of uncontroversial things that there is absolute evidence to say this is what we should be doing, sort of this sort of low-hanging fruit. So based on those initial interviews, the Cochrane Review, and the expertise of our team, we came up with these 15 suggestions. There's the paper. Okay. So the first, recommend actions consistent with established goals and priorities. If you can leverage the things that are already occurring, um, your audit and feedback is going to have more effect. Um, coordinating with ongoing initiatives, um, collect pilot data on whether or not people think this is actually important. So it's an ongoing initiative, but it's something that's actually people already sort of believe are their personal or their unit or their surgical practice or their primary care practice, what their needs and priorities are. This increases attention, commitment, and intention to change behavior, which is one of the best predictors of actual change, behavior change. Recommend actions that have room to improve and are under the control of the recipient. This is a really important one for this group today, I think. So there's two things there. So things that have room to improve, I've already touched on that a little bit. But I'd suggest to go and actually measure baseline, know what the room for improvement is. Don't just assume that people are or are not doing that. And better if you had local data. Local data of that gap is actually more salient to, to otherwise compared to provincial data. But the idea of, of feedback that is under the control of the recipient. So think about that first example and how much control the physician has of whether the patient fills a prescription within the two weeks after they leave the hospital. And so did that, that think of that relationship. How much do I, how much can I control as an occupational therapist on a, in a hospital, the hospital's performance data, right? So it, it, human beings, we are masters at discounting data. We all believe we're doing a good job. And if we're given the opportunity to actually say, well, that's actually the thing I'm going to pay attention to because it's showing that I'm doing well, that kind of thing. It's just harder and harder to discount things that's actually right under the, my, my control. 
and recommend specific actions. So the second example maybe got a little close. It kind of insinuated that I'd done something three times and I really needed to do it nine. It didn't tell me exactly what to do, but at least it was a little more kind of in that direction about what it was that I was supposed to do. But if we just give people feedback and leave it up to them to figure out what to do, they're probably not going to do a single thing. So this notion of an action plan, something that goes along with it. If we just send people a couple graphs, here's you, here's your peers, that's what I sort of I would call a knowledge-based in intervention. It's telling people information. And that's great. That increases my knowledge. Wonderful. Now I just move on to something else. If we actually want to change behavior, a knowledge-based intervention is useless at that. So even going to conferences, didactic lectures like this telling you things, your behavior will not change one tiny bit when you leave this because of what I'm telling you now. And there's strong evidence. You're going to have to do something with what you're finding out today if you really want to change what you're doing in terms of how you use this data. Be provided multiple times. It is shocking. Some of these things seem obvious, and if you actually look at the audit and feedback that's done, it's not done. So in those current 140 trials, 24% of that, a quarter of that feedback is given once, a quarter of it, we had no idea. So these are, these are published studies, and we could not, two people, and then a third to double check, could not figure out how many times it was given. Something as simple as that, reported so poorly. But a quarter of it was only given once. So there's a lot of people um, in my field that would say, actually, if you give it once, it's not audit and feedback. That theoretically, that's actually, it's not. That was just you gave someone their baseline performance, you just told them how they're doing. That in order for it to be audit and feedback, you need to tell them how they're doing, give them an opportunity to change, then give them feedback on what they may or may not have done. So at least two times to even be able to call it audit and feedback. So I think we need to replace the one-off. So I think this is really relevant. So Stephen, I think, right? No, Matthew. Matthew in our group was talking about how um, some of the data is collected once every four years and then sort of sent once to people. So I think we kind of need to, we need to reframe that model. Less data, but more frequently, something to think about. It's related to this one also. Be provided as soon as possible. So the better way to explain this is just don't give people old data. Um, and this is really relevant for how we collect this data, how long it takes to collect it. But the older the data is, it gives people the opportunity to discount it. And the default condition of human beings is to discount anything that doesn't fit my belief system. And my belief system is that I'm an amazing occupational therapist, I'm a very good primary care physician, whatever it happens to be. And so the, the, it has, you have to work really hard to be able to change that belief system. Um, one thing that goes along with this I think is important, um, this concept is also related to how often you do the behavior. So not all data, but there is a relationship between how often something happens. So if I have 10 opportunities a day to give a flu vaccine to an older adult, giving me weekly feedback sort of might be okay. Or even data from three months ago, if I'm doing it all the time, sort of versus something that I am only come up against this once or twice a month. So then data from eight months ago might mean more to me. So generally don't give old data, but it does actually matter how much you're sort of faced with that behavior. Be as specific to the individual as possible. Um, and this is hard. Most of the, the audit feedback that's done, about a little more than half is given to an individual provider, about 25% individual patient cases that's actually given back to a provider. So we could be doing better with that and it's not one minute, thanks. Um, and that one minute to 20, right? <laughs> one minute to 20 minutes? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so we could be doing better with this. Um, and I think this is actually one of the really important ones. Um, what we've seen even in hand washing is sort of constant um, negating feedback until we can get right down to how much are you washing your hands. And even that is a little bit problematic, but um, it, discounting is, we're so good at that. Include comparators that reinforce the desired behavior. Most of the audit and feedback is actually my group's performance compared to another group. When you think about it, it doesn't denote a goal at all. It doesn't tell me what it is that I'm doing. If we're all doing horribly, then it doesn't matter. If I'm doing a little bit better than my peers, I'm going to go, whew, I'm good. 
even though we're all really, really bad. So having a benchmark, a goal that sort of says, this is where we all should be, and this is where you are, this is where your group is. And we should avoid multiple comparators. We sort of think, give people lots of information, but people will choose the comparator they prefer. And the comparator, that means they don't have to do anything, and the comparator that says, I'm doing a good job. <coughs> Closely link visual display and summary messages. So this is actually what it looks like on the page, which matters a lot. And some of the work that I've been doing um, with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario, we've been developing a feedback intervention. And I think there's a lot of thinking that sort of says, okay, let's put all the graphs on page one. Great, we'll put all that together and we'll put all the key messages on page two. You can imagine thinking, right? Like that actually intuitively makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't in terms of effectiveness. So the key message needs to be by the graph. You need to put those things together. So you're better to actually just do two graphs with key messages as opposed to a page of 20 graphs and 20 key messages. Presented in multiple ways face-to-face, -face, and written, et cetera. It's it is meant to attract their attention, give options for different learners, and give people more sort of a mental picture of what's actually going on. I'm gonna go through these quickly so we've still have the 10 minutes to discuss. Cognitive load is huge, really, really important. The work that I've been done with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the idea is put everything there, put absolutely everything there. And what Pete, we've been doing interviews with people, the targets, who this is actually meant for. Saying, but I, like, I, I don't even know where to start, I don't even know what to look at. Again, under the assumption that I've got two minutes of that person's time, um, this is really, really important. Address barriers to feedback. I think it's sort of important to start sort of look at what are, what are, what are going to prevent people from using this. Find those things out and integrate that into your plan. Short, actionable messages followed by more detail. There is some evidence to suggest this notion of graded entry. Give people exactly what you want, but give other people opportunities to dig deeper. And this is one of the things we're doing with this Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care work. Um, address uh, issues of credibility of the information absolutely up front. So feedback from trusted data, disclose conflicts of interest, etc. With our ministry data, we were actually interviewing people and asking them if they knew what the Rye Home Care database was, which was the database that we were using. People either either didn't know what it was, the people that don't work with it, and the people that do work with it absolutely didn't trust it. So the entire system is based on data that no one is actually going to trust. So that's great. Um, prevent defensive reactions. This one is tough. Try to avoid punitive, negative things. That's great. You're doing really sort of good with this as a, as a key message, but there's room for improvement, that type of thing. And lastly, um, encourage sort of social construction of, of the feedback. I think up until now, we've been very much thinking that feedback, we've been treating it like a knowledge-based information. If people just knew, if they could just see where they were as a comparison to others, the magic would occur and everything would get better. But well, there's more and more data to suggest that you have to sort of inject some sort of social um, construction. So groups of physicians that get together and talk about their feedback to action plan, that kind of thing. Um, and very quickly, one of the things that we're doing under the leadership of Jeremy Grimshaw is to develop these laboratories of audit and feedback. So don't have to worry about the details here, but these are sort of two examples of lots of work that's going around internationally to look at comparing different types of feedback head to head. Instead of usual care versus audit and feedback, no one should ever do that. We know it works. We should look at testing two different types of audit and feedback head to head. So what Jeremy is doing is saying, wow, what if we had a meta library, laboratory? What if we actually looked at the delivery of all sorts of different ways of doing audit and feedback and combined those all into one sort of big, huge data set? We'd be much more further ahead in five years compared to the 20 years it would take to kind of one by one test this against this. And so I was just going to mention that if anyone is doing some interesting audit and feedback work and wants to link with our group, we're looking for labs for the meta laboratory and that's it so i know that was really quick but we've got uh